I'm Ted George, founder and chief narrative officer of Playhouse Advisory, and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel. Today, our panel title is No Silver Bullet, Assessing Trade Tech Strengths and Limitations. I looked at trade tech in my opening keynote, which is available on demand, and the impact it can have on East Africa's agricultural value chain. Trade tech is a catch-all term, and it could be said to encompass agri-tech, reg tech, even nature tech, uh, the latest ESG watchword. But none of these are single technologies. Rather, they are different combinations of old and new innovations backed by the huge improvement in hardware and computing power of recent years. But as I said in my presentation, trade tech, like any technology, is no silver bullet. There is much skepticism about trade tech and what it is promising to deliver. And today we shall dissect the pros and cons of trade tech uh, for Africa, but also the, wide, uh, the wider global market. For our discussion, I'm joined by a panel with a wide variety of expertise. But um, before we start, um, I thought, why don't we have a poll of the audience? Um, the poll is uh, live now, and you can uh, do, um, uh, vote on the poll using your voting button. And the question is, I wonder if you could put the poll up on screen, please. Um, what, in your opinion, is the most compelling user case for trade tech? Is it sharing confidential documentation? Is it traceability? Um, oh, sorry, I have this on screen, unfortunately. Uh, is it blockchain solutions? Is it KYC onboarding and AML? Is it logistics or is it one of the, uh, the holy grails, which is, of course, increasing yields and increasing margins? So if you'd like to vote on that, and please do vote. And while you're voting, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. So uh, ladies first, could we start with Mate? Thank, thank you, Ted. I'm Mate Dermastia and I'm CEO of Fantea Africa. And uh, happy to be here, and particularly because about three years ago, I more or less accidentally bumped on transparency and traceability digital tools, and happening that this become quite a boom, and I will be very happy to discuss today how this transparency and traceability can impact the regional trade in East Africa. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. And next up, Yvonne. Thank you very much, Ted. My name is Yvonne Otieno. I am from Nyonga Fresh Greens. We are basically a company that works in export of fresh fruits, dried fruits, and powders to Europe. And we're excited to share our experience on the use of trade tech in this technology, trade tech, especially how we've used it in East Africa and get access to market. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, uh, next up, Josephine. Um, my name is Josephine Mwangi. I'm a trade product manager at Standard Bank Kenya, where I'm responsible for trade product operationalization, uh, maintenance and oversight of trade product technology, product risk management, managing the delivery of trade product innovation, implementation of the trade product product, and happy to be here to discuss the impact of trade tech on the banking industry. That's right. Thanks, Josephine. Um, could I ask um, everyone who isn't speaking to just go on mute? We seem to be getting a bit of feedback. Maybe Nia Chair and McKeel, if you could do that, thanks. Um, but, well, not McKeel, because actually next up, if you could introduce yourself, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Michael Hendricks. I'm the executive director of the Farmstrong Foundation based in Switzerland. Uh, we design and implement uh, sustainability programs uh, in commodity supply chains in Sub-Saharan Africa with a heavy focus, heavy doses, if you like, uh, on, on digital technology and everything we will uh, discuss uh, today. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thanks very much. And last but by no means least, Nidja. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nidja. I am a product manager at Acuity, now LexisNexis. Um, essentially, I'm the problems guy. I come from the vendor side, so we provide trade tech solutions. Um, my responsibility to understand the problems you are facing at banks or at corporations, and, and we as a company offer a portfolio of solutions, could be data, software, analytics. Trade personally is very interesting. It's, it's everywhere. It's one of the key and arguably one of the most exciting use cases for us in the team. Great to be here. Thank you, GTR. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, excellent. Well, look, before we get into our uh, discussion with a very interesting panel of experts, could we put up the results of the poll on screen, please? And as we can see there, it's quite an even mix. It started off very much in the middle, but now we can see the clear winner there with over 27% is traceability. 
And that is one of the things that we will definitely be discussing. So I'm not surprised at all. It is very much about visibility. Blockchain solutions is very high. And I think also seeing KYC and onboarding, um, that makes a lot of sense because of course, you can't do anything until you've actually onboarded someone. But logistics up there as well, because it is all about IoT. So I would say it's quite good to see that kind of mix, but I wonder what the initial feelings are of the panel. Uh, maybe if I could start with you, Matea, what do you think of the, uh, the poll results? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's as I said at the beginning, I'm not actually surprised, you know, it's traceability, uh, it's becoming the key point and COVID really pushed on this and made even novel, it's in combination of traceability and transparency and having the technology to support mm -hmm. this, as you said, it's not a silver bullet point and let's discuss this, how to really help the trade to use this and to make the big progress for East Africa. That's great. Fantastic. And Mikhail, this must be music to your ears as so much of your business is about traceability. Uh, yeah, of course. And, and, and I'm also not, not surprised that this came up, but I, I, I'm very much uh, in agreement with what you said earlier. Uh, it's it's combination of all these things which are had to be implemented all at the same time uh, to have a good grip uh, on, on what is uh, what is really going on, uh, uh, whether it's we talk about it later, but uh, you talk about digital systems, uh, but at the end of the day, where, what goes in comes out and whether that is good information, good data or, or, or bad data, doesn't matter whether that's on paper uh, or, or, or digitally uh, available. Uh, but I, I think it, it, it is something what, what people are, are looking for. They want to know where products come from. I think that's very important, uh, but also have transparency or where money or prices or premiums go to so it's 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 i think a two-way system and has to be looked at it at uh, in that way absolutely thanks and uh, josephine what do you think of the poll anything surprising in there no nothing surprising um, um traceability is a, a major problem statement of today's supply chains is the lack of visibility and transparency at every stage of the journey so mm -hmm. this type of technologies will obviously then give us the means to create more intelligent supply chains that are then capable of tracking and tracing and authenticating different types of goods so no surprises there mm -hmm. thanks uh, nature your views on this yeah, I think this is pretty much in line with what everyone is saying. So for me, I see this as what are the biggest pains or the biggest gains which people are expecting from use of trade tech. I mean, there was probably a survey done by the Asian Development Bank in 2019. It talked about KYC and AML. But today, because with pandemic and with supply chain changes and evolution of trade, it is kind of not a brain. It's not a new thing that, oh, we need to trace everything. But I also think they're not independent of each other. There is an interlinking between traceability and logistics and KYC and increasing yields. So all of them are interlinked. It's not one or the other. It's probably a combination of uh, them. Yeah, and I think that's a good explanation of why it's so hard to sell trade tech as an idea, because it's about what do you want to do with it? Well, those are things you can do with it. And uh, Yvonne, your view on the poll? Well, I'm also not surprised that traceability has come out on top. And uh, um, at the end of the day, when you're trying to do a business and you can actually trace it right to the end, I was actually expecting that the KYC would actually come at the top because what's at the end of traceability? It's people. So I think that the two have come up is quite telling. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Well, you can continue voting. We might see if it's shifted by the end there, but thank you for that. It's set up very well the discussion we want to have. And I really want to get to the nub of the argument straight away, which is what is trade tech useful for? This really gets to the point of pros and cons and silver bullets. And I'm particularly to know where is it showing its usefulness now, rather than just wouldn't it be nice if we could, where can we see it actually happening? So um, I wonder if I can start by asking each of you from your own perspective, um, where you see trade tech being most successfully applied and the benefits it's bringing. I wonder if I could start with you, Josephine. I understand you've done a lot of work when it comes to automation and risk management using new tech. Yeah, thanks, Ted. So uh, traditionally, trade finance has seen slow acceptance of trade tech with documentary trade continuing to be highly paper intensive and dependent on traditional banking methods. However, with the pandemic and the ensuing challenges that it brought about, uh, they, they have had a significant impact on supply chains and therefore banks had to then quickly adopt to better support our clients and conform to an ever-changing regulatory environment. So adoption of trade tech has therefore now become obligatory as opposed to just this theoretical concept. There are various technologies with uh, which the industry has turned to to automate their processes such as blockchain, artificial intelligence and machine learning amongst others with various measures of success. Uh, specifically at Stanbic, we embarked on an ambitious digitization program for trade 
where we then uh, are endeavoring to provide end-to-end trade finance solutions for our clients. The implementation of these digital technologies will bring about not only enhanced operational efficiency for the bank, but also unlock tremendous benefits for both the bank and the clients. Uh, just as an example is our recent partnership with TradeSun to digitize our document checking capabilities. Um, this AI-driven cloud platform combines deep learning and natural language processing to facilitate the quick processing of our trade finance documents. So that we've integrated the platform with two other two other different platforms to manage, uh, to uh, be able to automate our sanction screening processes, to be able to do dual use tracking for uh, goods that our, our clients are importing, and also vessel tracking capabilities where we can then be able to track a particular vessel that is mentioned in any of our documents from the port of loading to when it actually discharge, it discharges. And this is within our trade document examination uh, processes. And this then obviously then further enhances our compliance checking capabilities. This has brought about tremendous benefits for our clients in the form of improved customer experience through reduced waiting times and enhanced accuracy in the review of their trade documents. Our export clients have experienced cash acceleration uh, as a result, obviously, of the reduced processing times and also the increased accuracy in examination of their documents. Uh, for the bank, we've seen improved operational efficiencies, enhanced risk management and a potential reduction in costs. We are at uh, various stages of other uh, deliveries or in terms of our uh, of automation journey. And with this, we then should be able to unlock tremendous benefits for our clients as we partner with them in their growth aspirations. Thanks. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Josephine. It's really interesting to see the wide ranging impact that the adoption of this kind of technology can have on the way that businesses are run and risk is managed. Um, I wonder if I go to you, Nirchar, as well. Another real area that trade check has been applied has been to do with reg tech or preventing financial crime and particularly using machine learning and AI. Uh, where do you see that being successfully applied, particularly when it comes to the idea of emerging and, and East Africa's market? So as Josephine explained, right, she, she gave a classic example. I, I can only build upon that. And that's exactly the same space our tools help our customers with. So traditionally, banks and corporates, they all get into the space. But just to get tee this up a little bit, let me give everyone a bit around the context. Why is this such a complex problem? And what are the kind of benefits available for both corporates and banks to look at it? So why is this use of trade compliance or financial mitigation of trade risk so important? So again, it's a very complex problem. So Josh Phoenix kind of explained there are four main criteria. So you kind of do entities, you want to look at individuals or companies involved in it. There's a lot of fuzzy matching. How do you spell the name, that differences, and all of those? There are goods. So there are dual use goods, some different controls in place, export controls, import controls. There are vessels. So you not only monitor how the vessels are going, but you also monitor the ownership structure, any dark activity they're involved with. And of course, the last bit, which is the documents, which is probably has come up recently with the digitization and the impact or the kind of uptake of digitization is become very popular. So that's how the complex the problem is. You've got four or five different things moving all over the place and there is no single stagnant view. But we've also um, provided a case study of one of the other banks in Nordics who've used this. Um, and the benefits are huge. So some of them, which Josephine already explained, I will kind of also emphasize on the knowledge the spread of knowledge. So like, for example, a bromobenzene cyanide, it's a common name for tear gas, but there are different controls across the world, different geographies allow it, different geographies don't allow it. And it is spread. So you can't have that knowledge spread across your team so easily. And how will you explain thousands of products to thousands of people? So a system kind of helps in. Then the second question is around the continuous monitoring, uh, which is very, very important because you change one thing today and the trade changes, new documents are updated, new information is available. So they all get complicated. The last thing is probably to do with how you tackle the regulatory requirements. So the audit trail, the consistency of doing it, the explainability behind it. So you kind of get the industry best practices. And in all of this together, so automation of the trade operations in general across banks and corporations have helped a lot. With Machine learning and AI, there has been uptake kind of reduction of the inconsistency. It's trying to automate as much as possible. But at the end of the day, human have to review it, at least to some percentage. What percentage needs to be humanly reviewed? That changes with machine learning. Right? So that's from my end. 
Absolutely. I think it just opens up a whole new world in terms of how much data you can take on. But then, of course, sometimes you get uh, paralysis through analysis as well. Exactly. <laughs> well, I wonder if I could just uh, move on to the sort of broader issues as well in terms of what trade tech can do, because it ultimately is about removing barriers. And one of the most important barriers to trade, of course, is borders and everything about different kind of regulatory regimes. So I wonder if I could ask you, Matea, um, do you think trade tech could be a very useful tool for promoting regional trade and cross-border trade? Uh, Ted, thank you for this question. And uh, before I answer, I will just sh uh, share a very, very short story with you. I said accident that I accidentally bumped on transparency and traceability. So let's put it this way. About three years ago, it is maybe even four now, we start working in agriculture value chains in East Africa. And it's become, uh, and we start combining, you know, to see how we can use the digital tools to upgrade our consultancy knowledge on a, on a value chains, you know, and how to map it, how to understand. And then it comes to the point, you know, first of all, we figure out everything is focused on farmers, okay? And there is nothing much about what is about the agribusiness who can work with the farmers and then who can sell something on the market, okay? And then, you know, even more, which should become uh, very obviously that there is no tools who can help agribusinesses. In addition to this, you know, it's become very obviously that there we, we do not have tools which can accumulate certificate standards and uh, regulation requirement, name it, you know, it was mentioned several times today and it will be probably even more. It's how to share this, combine farmers, combine agribusinesses and then the trade. Then COVID comes, you know, and become even more obviously that there is tremendous potential in East Africa market, you know, because the market is growing. We do have cities, you know, the people are getting more money, you know, they can buy product. There's no really need to go everything to United States or in, or in Europe, but still there is no digital tools. Now I will go back, you know, to Nation, which said everything is totally complex. Exactly. It's too complex. And then, you know, it's when we're working, you know, we figure out, you know, focus on the data points which really matter. And this is agribusinesses, those who can really add value to the value chains and can combine upstream and downstream. And only, you know, through one year that we are working in, you know, now really, you know, getting clients. And we, Yvonne is here today with us, you know, it's focusing on the right data point, you know, and focusing on the right information to be shared. You can really increase trade, e even without very complicated digital tools. So my answer to you is, yes, it is absolutely super good tool, you know. It's COVID, it's a good time, you know, to improve, to, to help agribusinesses and improve the trade in East Africa. And I would be the first one who can really preach that this is a great, that digital tools can support the East African trade. And it cannot be so complex if you nail it down to make it more simple. That's Please. lovely. Thank you, Matea. Beautifully put. Well, I wonder if I can move to you now, Mikhail. Um, one of the most interesting uses of trade tech has been uh, to do with monitoring of the supply chain and the agricultural value chain. Um, how is it being used in cocoa in West Africa and, and you know, and, and all across Africa in that sense? And, and how effective is it? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Ted. Uh, it was already uh, mentioned uh, by earlier uh, about the consistency of, of the data and the quality of the data and the validation of the data. Uh, so, hey, uh, of course, uh, we work, lots of people work now with traceability, they work with mapping, uh, 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 all fine, uh, but, but we have noticed that you really have to put in different layers of verification uh, and make sure that uh, the data is consistent and makes sense. Uh, because that's the way you can pick out anomalies, you can pick out things that well, uh, maybe even trends, uh, you can pick up mistakes, uh, sometimes unintentional, but sometimes also intentional, which some people can call fraud. Uh, so you really have to, to, to build in your, uh, your, your, your verification, uh, uh, data verification systems. Uh, with We do that, for example, with uh, satellite image analysis, about land use. Uh, so somebody, somebody can claim, you know, I have a cocoa plantation, but actually if you, if you load up his his uh, polygon of his cocoa farm that actually turns out to be a, a palm oil farm uh, or, or nothing. Huh? So you really have to, to build uh, stuff on this. Uh, you can use even more sophisticated remote sensing technologies now with LIDAR to see now what's happening uh, with, with, with forest deforestation, big issue in, 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 in Africa or uh, in many other places. Uh, and, and as was mentioned, now we do that with, with artificial intelligence uh, to reduce uh, the, the human influence or the human bias uh, to, to the maximum. Uh, and, and I think there uh, you, you can you can actually uh, ha have a system with these different verification uh, uh, layers uh, and then actually you know, validate uh, the, the, the authenticity, which was also mentioned earlier, of, of what you have. Uh, just, just trusting it because it's digital is, 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 is dangerous. Uh, it, it gives you a perceived 
uh, uh, assurance, a, a perceived sense of, of it, it's fine because it's digital. That that is a that's a tricky one. Huh? You have to, you have to build in these verification procedures, uh, and and that gives you a lot of information. Huh? You you mentioned earlier, you know, the the, the, the KYC. Uh, in our case, it's probably more uh, KYS. Now the supplier, uh, how how well uh, is is he behaving? How well is he compliant uh, uh, to standards, for example? Uh, uh, and uh, relying again very often on people doing the compliance analysis, uh, may, maybe using uh, satellite images and, and, and uh, machine learning and, and, and all these things uh, has support actually the, the quality of the data and therefore can be used uh, uh, as, as data to make analysis and, and so forth. Yeah, and of course, it's incredibly powerful what you can do with that analysis. It gets better and better. You can track individual farms. You can track encroachment yeah. on land, things like yeah. that. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and at the mm -hmm. same time, you, you can combine it with other technologies, as you mentioned earlier, uh, so that there are, are uh, systems available, data uh, available uh, about the, the weather, about uh, soil humidity, uh, uh, about air humidity, uh, air temperature, soil temperature. So you can build it in all these different things in, in your uh, mapped farmer base and actually now start talking about now climate smart or uh, in intelligent agriculture, which has no benefits for everybody. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Miguel. Well, I wonder if I could just have another look at another uh, interesting case, and we haven't talked about this, and this is really the consumers and the clients. And um, I wonder if Yvonne, if I could get your views here, how do you think trade tech and the kind of technologies we're talking about could improve the user experience and build trust with clients? Okay, thank you very much, Ted. And I was smiling really hard when uh, Michael was speaking because he was talking about the things that really matter to us. And I will speak, uh, I will speak more from a supplier point of view. And uh, I'll first just clarify that trade tech, every time people talk about trade tech, the first the key word that I've heard people talking about is it's complicated, it's complicated. But one thing is that I can say is that it's as complicated as you want it to be and as simple as you actually create it to be. Simple in the sense that it can help solve three things. Everyone is actually in trade for three reasons. Number one, you're really trying to get business done as conveniently as possible as you can and to make sure that whoever you're trading with is actually the right person that you can trust, is reliable, and can deliver what they say that they can deliver. And thirdly, are they going to do it for you in an efficient way? And that's, with, uh, that's what Jocelyn has brought up. Uh, so... When I say it can be as simple as you want it to be, it's just as simple as we we started out as farmers. And as farmers, one of the ways that we had to actually pay our, our some of our workers was using the investor. That's already technology. That's a mobile money payment. And that's already trade tech in its use. Our first big client, when we went into exports, found us through a website. That's already trade technology. And then as I go into, it can be as simple and as complicated as you want it to be. When we started to work with bigger clients in Europe that did want to know what is the product, where is the product coming from, where is the location, where is the farmer, is this farmer certified, then we had to involve a little bit more data. So it just depends on what are the user points, that, what are the key, what's the key information that different users need to have. And at the end of the day, as uh, uh, I think... Uh, Michael talked about it is uh, it's it's more than just about trusting the technology because behind every technology is a human being who's using that technology. So it becomes about do you have are you building a value chain of trust that's actually providing information in a transparent way, a way that you can verify it, it's authentic, and at the end of the day, saving you the time. So trade tech in the end helps to build convenience to the users and facilitate trade in a more efficient and transparent way. Thank you. That's great, thank you so much. Well, I think it's really interesting, all the different uh, discussions we've had so far, there are multiple uses here we see for trade tech, and we also see it's a catch-all term for a lot of digitalization which is going on and the removing of barriers, which lets you put things together in different ways. So the question I have for you is, what is holding back the adoption of technologies that make up trade tech? Is it the cost? Is it the complexity? Or is it just that everyone is too busy fighting fires to have the headspace to take on new ideas? So I wonder, maybe Nidja, what's your view? What do you think is holding back uh, the adoption of the trade tech? Oh, thank you. Um, I think it's a fantastic question to follow up. I think I'll keep this short. I think there are two or three important factors which is holding back. One, of course, is the cost. And uh, depends on what the best practices are. Sometimes it's a language barrier in terms of what technology you use and what technology is available in. Um, but also one of the biggest factors is the knowledge of using the tech uh, and the connectivity required. So that comes in. 
but i also think that attitude towards technology is probably one of the biggest things so in this panel probably it's not that bad it's everyone is quite open to it everyone has great examples but we all know explaining that to everyone else across the world has been challenging we have to take everyone through the benefits explain that there is an initial ramp up of, of cost but the benefits come down the line um and everyone sometimes so for example we did a survey of trade compliance and one of the biggest things which we have seen change over the last few years is that previously compliance was always seen as a cost now a good compliance program or a give kyc aml program sets out customers or banks as a differentiator so that means as Yvonne was explaining the cost or the time required for the and again Jocelyn is explaining the time required to serve a customer has reduced from 5 days to 5 hours because you have everything automated you're using systems so the customer experience changes and it takes time to explain and implement such a process so it's kind of a combination of people the attitude and the knowledge yeah and i guess is the whole thing that too often people want you to wave a magic wand and you can't it takes time to change <laughs> exactly Yeah. And uh, what about you, Josephine? Uh, what have you found have been the main kind of blockages to getting the adoption of these new processes, particularly in a large institution like yours? So, um, agreeing with Nija, uh, cost is a key factor. Uh, trade finance continues to operate in an environment of shrinking margins, and therefore budgets are consistently under pressure and also competing with various other interests. adoption of these uh, trade tech solutions has not been progressive therefore many institutions are finding themselves in situations where circumstances are forcing them to have to automate their processes within a short period of time so by playing catch up the corresponding return on investment will not be immediate so, hence institutions supporting trade have to be ready to avail the budgets required for adoption of the solutions without the expectation for a quick return on that investment all in all uh, and as nija has mentioned the cost efficiencies that digitization can bring are invaluable and must be considered when calculating the return on investment um secondly is the availability of human capital required to facilitate the adoption of these solutions institutions need to decide on whether to adopt technologies that are then developed by their in-house teams or contract with other third party entities more often than not you'll find that a hybrid of the same will be required in order to accelerate the development of these digital technologies while at the same time managing costs and tight timelines so integration of the different platforms and or solutions will therefore be necessary as we then seek to provide these end to end solutions for our clients Yes so, so I can see it's very complicated indeed but I think it's interesting that uh, there's a viewpoint here that it has to be taken into account that there are efficiency gains and they've got to be put into the cost as well in terms of the gains you make from that you know exactly. um yes and Mikhail how about from your perspective as someone who um you know is using these kinds of technologies why do you think more businesses are not using them what has been holding that back um i i think a uh, uh, a lot of companies are still uh, interested to keep a, a, a high degree of in transparency you know exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do uh, because they still believe uh, very old fashioned very traditional uh, and, and conservative that that's the way you can make money uh, and and we're doing actually exactly the opposite uh, and and with a very positive fallout uh, we we started uh, i think 2017 with with making payments with mobile money uh, to 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 coco farmers in in cote d'ivoire uh, everybody said well they don't want it they didn't want it well they love it uh, uh, and and the, and the people who who try to discourage us were basically because they were benefiting of paying them cash yeah because whatever maybe he had so, something disappeared somewhere at some point but but the advantage we actually uh, had by introducing these mobile money payments to farmers is that when you provide it with a sim card have with a mobile money account uh, you have to have a a an id with with a photo uh, we have in our database already where the family lives where is their house where is the farm how much do they produce and suddenly you can build a, a file per family which makes them bankable Uh, everybody's always banging their heads against the wall well, farmers are not bankable they don't have access to finance uh, why don't they have access to farm because we don't know anything about them yeah but the moment you start doing this uh, your your kys uh, uh, suddenly now is is enriched and people can open a bank account if they want and we don't force them to but they can uh, so there are more and more advantages uh, by introducing these things and and linking linking them all up uh, uh, and, and build this transparency and uh, which actually means a, a, a big a big step forward uh, for for the farmers now that the the people we develop these programs for and so i'm 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 all for it uh, and and uh, i i i try to help to push transparency and even the people who are maybe not so in favor they they will figure out that it makes no total sense to do it uh, because that will be the norm 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's definitely coming when you look at what the US and the EU and, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. all of them are planning. Yes. And the UK, of course, itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I wonder, um, Yvonne, your view on this one as well, from your perspective, where have you find the barriers been for uh, the adoption of some of these technologies? Well, I'll say the barriers to some of these technologies, as you said, sometimes you realize how important it is. For those who can invest in it and are not investing in it is the ignorance. And again, um, uh, what Michelle talked about is that uh, people are thinking that being transparent will mean you'll be able to, you'll lose money other than make money. But then there's also, um, besides the ignorance, there's also the issue of um, how, uh, how simple it is. Uh, or rather, I will talk about people are not looking, people are looking at the immediate uh, needs that they have as a business and not looking at trade for the future. If you start looking at how you're going to trade in the future, you start looking at what generation is going to be trading in the next 10 years. There'll be a generation that's basically just doing everything using technology, either through their mobile phones, and that's how they'll be operating. So if you're short-sighted, you will not actually, you will consider the current cost as too expensive, while you'll actually lose more if you don't invest in trade technology at this point. Because if you look at trade for the future, it's the young people who are going to be using technology to do the trade. Sorry, Ted. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, sorry, Ted. Uh, so it's the young people who will actually be trading and you'll need to invest in technology to make sure that... I would seem to be losing you, are you there? Anyway, thanks. Well, listen, maybe if I could ask you, Matea, the final word on this, from your side as well, where have you seen barriers to adoption to these new kinds of technology? Okay, I will not repeat everything what was said because it's absolutely everything is uh, what we experienced as well from the capacity to understanding, willingness, things like this absolutely has to come to, uh, as a first place. So those I would only add something is which is for years and years, you know, transparency and supply chains were part, let's say, of supply chain management. So supply chain managers, you know, maybe when it comes to a sustainable goals development it comes to the pr and mar uh, the, the marketing what we are experiencing and when we can proceed fast and also as a consultancy or also as a tech is when uh, uh high uh, when uh, let's say the managers directors ceos are engaged in the business and then because they understand what can this be the giant for the trade you know to be transparent and to join the cell to to be uh, to be trade to to do more trade when you are more transparent so engagement of the high level people from from COOs, it's if you mind if you I believe it's the main obstacles because they still do not understand that this is their job. But it's coming, and as I will go back to COVID, it's come with the COVID, it's coming to the board of the rector's room. This is what we experience, and I believe that now it will go much, much faster. That's great. Thanks very much, Matea. So um, before I move on to the next question, I just want to, again, invite anyone or uh, delegates to submit questions. We have a few questions uh, there. We're going to be picking up on some of them in a couple of minutes. But I'd just like to take some time to talk about this whole issue of transparency, because it was, it's been mentioned a number of times, and it really is central to so much of what trade tech is about. Trade tech has often been described as a transparency tool, because it's ideal for tracing goods as they work their way through the supply chain. But is there a danger that all of this data is giving us a false sense of security? Um, is there a problem with the data? So maybe, Mikhail, could you just explain a bit more how the data is problematic and, and how are we perhaps also drawing the wrong conclusions from what we're seeing? Well, I, I, I think I, I have, we mentioned that earlier a, a few times. Uh, 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 it, it's the, the, the old expression, oh, uh, rubbish in, uh, rubbish out. Uh, so it, it had the system, of course, uh, these systems give enormous uh, access on lots of data and you can use them for lots of uh, very good things uh, as, as we discussed. Uh, but I, I, what I can see in, in our work uh, is that, you know, that, that, that validation aspect is so important uh, so be able to judge uh, whether the data you work with is of a good quality uh, because as you know now if the data is is not right uh, your analysis is not right uh, your uh, uh, conclusion is not right and your recommendations is not right uh, so uh, the 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 way to, to deal with data, understanding the data, where it's coming from, uh, where uh, can possibly uh, a fraud uh, occur. Uh, so you can actually you know, use the data uh, because you have, had, it's, it's well, another famous word, now the big data, uh, you have so much data, so you can actually figure out when something is not 
uh, within a, a range uh, of, of anticipated uh, uh, variants. Uh, so you can pick out things are uh, awkward. Well, what's going on? As I said earlier, it can be a mistake, but can also be fraud. Uh, and, and, and we know uh, in, in the ecosystem uh, where we operate, uh, uh, things are not always what they look. Uh, so you have to you have to build in these I call it I think layers of verification to make sure uh, that the input data is of a high quality, so you can actually use it for the purposes meant to be. Uh, um, so that 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 full, uh, that full sense of, of uh, security because it's digital, I think, uh, requires a bit of, of thought and reflection. Don't accept everything. You know, ask ask questions, dig into these things, and make sure what you have is is of high quality. Uh, and then, then it, it's 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 very uh, usable for, for everybody and, and, and indicative uh, for for the overall the overall uh, the transparency of the of the business, uh, which everybody's asking for, you know, whether it's public or private. That's great. Thanks, Miguel. And Matea, your end is on this one as well. Have you found challenges with the data? Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Uh, rubbish in, rubbish out, you know, and we have uh, years ago experience with the blockchain, you know, but the technology doesn't help, it's rubbish is coming in, you know, so it's what we, uh, and because of this data, you know, we really focus on this, you know, to do first on the paperwork, hand by hand, uh, do it analog, you know, what has to be done, you know, and then use technology to enhance this transparency. And also, you know, what we, we are trying to do is, you know, to find some kind, let's say, here is a buyer and a seller and first help them, you know, to agree what they will exchange and what is there for them, you know, and then proceed step by step to add and add more complex data. And uh, yeah, and then use technology to, to help them to proceed the data because yeah, it will stay for eight years to come, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out. And it's much better to go step by step, you know, to clarify what can be collected, how you can collect, how you believe that it can be in a good way and a good faith, you know, because sometimes it also happened that they do not, uh, they, they do not want to be a fraud, you know, but it's just the data are wrong, okay? So, and this is why I will just, sorry, go back a bit, you know, if you really engage, you know, but I'm talking really about the East Africa, but also in Europe, you know, it's that if you really engage the high level people, the board of directors, you know, into the business, which is called transparency, okay, then I think that this fraud level will go down and down and transparency, the, the trust will come first, you know, it's a long way to go, but I, I am very optimistic that we are going on this direction. That's great. Thanks very much. And uh, Nitsha, your views on this whole question about the integrity of data? Yeah, so I think, I mean, everything has been said, rubbish in, rubbish out, but I will try to highlight two additional points on top of that. The first being the adoption of IT, IOT, that is internet enabled devices. Um, and the second one is digitally native. So what you will see is that as the adoption of these technical devices come in, more data will be captured digitally. So instead of trying to convert from analog to digital, you will get a digital copy or automatically inputted or somehow automatically inputted data in a digital format or even captured digitally by a device. Those things, uh, so that kind of probably solves some proportion of the problem in terms of not garbage in. So probably the output will be much better. And, and the second thing is, will we ever get to a point where everything is automated? I would, that's the balance. We've seen working with banks and corporates across the world. Everyone starts with, okay, let's trace every every trade or every container that's going out. Then they think, oh my God, the scale is so big that it's, it's almost not possible. How can we do everything? Then comes, oh, let's break this down. So let's identify which is the most risky elements or the riskiest trades which we need to track. So then it, the problem has become identification of risk and then tracking or monitoring those identified or high risky trade. And then comes, do we really want to do all that investments for everything, maybe for a smaller portion? And that kind of optimization of effort also kind of helps in. So just a journey everyone has to go through and every industry, every sector will eventually evolve. But again, adoption of technology from the very basic going digitally native will help. Yeah, and I think actually it's a really good point you make there. When you have to look at these problems and you say, well, we have a supply chain with 4,000 supplies in there. How do we do it? A lot of your approach is actually about how do you narrow it down? How do you use the technology to help you identify the ones you need to do the proper work on? That sort of stuff, yeah. Um, uh, I just want to, Josephine, do you have anything to add on the whole question of data integrity? Yeah, sure. So managing trade finance data is one of the biggest hurdles for banks. 
uh, firstly, due to the massive amount of data that banks have access to, and secondly, due to regulatory requirements of how, where, and uh, for how long that data can be stored. Adoption of trade technologies is resulting also in the production of massive volumes of data and institutions then as banks then have to develop structures on how to manage and standardize that data in a way that then makes it easy to consume. The first step obviously is that of then ensuring that as an organization we partner with trusted providers of trade tech uh, and this then ensures that the data that is generated is credible and verifiable. And secondly is the adoption of uh, big data analytics. Data on its own is of no value without being structured and standardized in a way that is then easier to consume. Organizations can then be able to analyze that data, uh, identify various data trends, and also flag anomalies, uh, therefore providing a holistic view of the products uh, uh, that our clients are using and the markets that they are operating in. So the increased sense of uh, transparency will then complement and enable, uh, give us business intelligence for purposes of decision making into insights and to products that our clients then require. And in all this, data privacy remains key for us as banks. We must ensure then that we operate under the this ambit, Kenya passed our comprehensive data protection legislation in 2019. And as banks, we need to ensure then that we are utilizing data in a way that does not violate our customers' trust. Absolutely. And that's really changed, actually, the way people look at data. In the old days, it was how can you get the data? And later on, have we signed all the right pieces of paper? Nowadays, it's from the very beginning. You want to be absolutely certain you're allowed to get the data, what you can do with it, where it should be stored, of course, is uh, another complicated one, indeed. Uh, thank you, Josephine. Maybe, Yvonne, do you just have a last word on data before we go to some questions from, uh, from the delegates? Yes. Um, for me, I would change, I would flip the question just a little bit, because you're talking about the integrity of the data. But there are cases where the data has some integrity, but the people managing the data don't have the integrity. So we also have to go back to where are the human values to make sure that we're not compromising the data. Thank you. Thanks, that's great. Well, it, that's great. That's actually one of the questions that was posed is if good data is key, how do we get around the problem of human error and dishonesty? Um, surely a human has to be involved in data inputting somewhere. But I wonder if I could ask you on this one, Makia. We've had this discussion before as well, but what are there ways that you can deploy technology now for collecting data that previously was collected manually where you can really snip out all these opportunities for fraud? Yeah. Uh, uh, again, it has been said before, hey, it, it's really combining diff different types of uh, technologies. Hey, so hey, uh, hey, our tablets are equipped with, with, with trackers and, and, and traces so we know where they are, what time uh, uh, they are used uh, over how many, uh, if you talk about a questionnaire or something, uh, that thing had lasts, for example, had a uh, half an hour. Uh, so if we didn't spot it's done in 10 minutes, well, that, that's not, not right. It's, if it, two hours is not right either. Not right either. Uh, so you, you have a lot of uh, uh, built-in um, cross, cross checks. Uh, uh, Nietzsche mentioned earlier, now if you talk about you now these Internet of Things and sensors, I mean, those are also very important. Uh, uh, it, that is, uh, but then again, the sensor before being installed has to be validated to make sure uh, it does what it's supposed to be doing. But also there you, 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 you can play around with. Uh, but uh, you mentioned also uh, the fact that you have more and more data, more people are actually working with this type of approach. Uh, you, you can actually see these inconsistencies very quickly and then the next question is then, uh, why is there an inconsistency? Uh, is that one particular person? Is it an area? Is the sector? Is it uh, so you can figure out w what went wrong there? Uh, and based on that, you can have learnings and you can ad adjust and adapt. Uh, and I think that is it, it's it's a continuous uh, uh, development or you know, uh, adopting uh, innovation goes at different rates for everybody. Uh, uh, so go for uh, the, the the more complicated um, exposed and then work work towards the the the, the, the end goal. Uh, but what we have seen so far, uh, it, it is it's extremely helpful. Uh, uh, but you have to you have to do it correctly. Uh, you cannot just trust on it like it because it's it's what I said earlier. You know, because it's digital. No, uh, yeah. you have to uh, you have to verify and uh, verify again and again and again uh, to make sure that that thing makes makes sense and and then it has a lot of value. Sure. Well, I think what's so interesting about it now is that you can use really good data. You're getting everything from satellites to drones to sensors. You get a really good snapshot of what's going on there. And that can tell you where you need to direct your human resources. So you then have to check everything on the ground. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, but also there, hey, uh, satellite technology is often used uh, uh, it, it's used by very large organizations. Uh, but if you really dig into that particular topic, there are lots of different levels of accuracy uh, and, and completeness because there's a lot of, especially if you talk about things like deforestation, uh, it's a big topic. You see that in all the newspaper every week. Uh, but most of the analysis done by, by satellite images is not that 
that, that good. Uh, so uh, there are different levels. Uh, and, and if you want to have uh, good data to make good decisions, uh, you have to understand what you, what you work with. Uh, yeah. And I think specifically uh, uh, satellite uh, image uh, uh, processing uh, has given people uh, uh, this this famous false sense of, of, of certainty. Uh, they think it is because it's come from a satellite. Yeah, but you, know, you have different levels. Uh, it's yeah. like like having mathematics when you're, you're 12 or you're 18 or, or doing a PhD. I mean, there are, there are different levels of, of, of understanding and knowledge. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, also, I've got a question here, um, uh, another one submitted. I'd like to ask Matea this one. It's quite interesting. It's, um, will the inability to access tech be the next form of illiteracy in Africa? This is for me? Yeah, I thought, well, maybe it just said what Yeah, no, 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 it's perfect. It's perfect. No problem at all, you know. it's. I'm coming from Slovenia originally, okay? And uh, we had the broadband long time ago, 20 years in every small village, even in uh, every month, mountains, okay? Okay, working in Kenya, I, I do not see any problem, you know, in any kind of digital divide. But going to other countries, it might. But I do have, a, again, a good faith, you know, that with the broadband and, you know, access to the digital tools in Africa, uh, we, we, I, I don't think that it will happen, you know. So it's because also, you know, if we do have, you know, the, la the, the last uh, research that we, we saw, you know, is that the penetration of digital tools in Africa is actually the highest in the world. So it's uh, if the governments and maybe donors will really help, you know, to, to really cover, you know, with the phones and with the, with the access to the broadband, I do not see a big problem, you know, at least on the countries like in, in East Africa, they, they can follow or even be ahead of the development, even in some countries in Europe. Absolutely. And I fully agree with you there. And also, it's amazing what they're doing with EdTech now. I mean, the amount of uh, material that you can deliver down, uh, you know, into a, a simple handset, uh, every educational local languages, teaching people to read. I mean, there's so much stuff now. Well, look, we're almost out of time, but there is time just for one more question. I'd like to get the view of each individual panelist. You've got 30 seconds, but it's just really to get down to the central point of what all real technology is about, particularly when it comes to anything to do with finance. And that really is about trust. Uh, you know, particularly when it comes to lending and trade, um, this each kind of technology that comes in is to try and build that trust. Um, how do you see trade tech building digital trust between transactors? Where do you think the real benefit could come from that from? Who'd like to go first? Or I'll choose someone. I can go first. Okay, you go first, please, Jasmine. Yeah. So um, one major risk in trade finance that a bank operating in a, in a largely manual environment will face is that of fraud. Um, in trade finance, trust is an integral part of the equation. And with the lack of transparency and accuracy that then is inherent in paper-based transactions, banks then have to take a cautious approach. And this has been one of the major drivers of the resultant trade finance gap that currently stands at about $1.5 trillion globally. So right. trade technologies um, such as blockchain are some of the solutions that then will integral in mitigating uh, fraud risk in, in trade. This solution, uh, this solution support the management of high volumes of trade documents and enable the verification of documents, therefore significantly reducing the risk of duplication and data tempering. Uh, invoices can be accessed and verified on a real-time basis, providing some level of transparency that then uh, will drive short-term financing. Uh, when combined with other solutions, uh, such as smart contracts, we can then be able to also automate payments uh, based on certain criteria being met such as the delivery of goods and all this then is being tracked and verified within uh, one platform. So the high transparency means that then as financiers we no longer have to have such a significant dependency on trust in order to avail financing to clients, thus ensuring that the liquidity is then getting to the places that is needed the most. Cool. That's great. Thanks very much. And Nijan, just very quickly, what do you think uh, is, uh, is the way trade tech can help build trust between clients? Yeah, I think trust has always been associated with what is at risk and who can provide me that trust. So there's always third parties who have been able to provide that trust. So I trust who is Ted, because Michaelia tells me that this is Ted. But I think given the technology is going, you will be able to use technology to trust each other. And that's what Josephine was telling. This whole blockchain and, and new technologies which are coming up, you will have enough data to trust the data, to trust the other party involved, and also correctly validate what is at risk. Thank you, Nitya. Uh, Yvonne, just very quickly, your own view, how important is uh, this kind of technology for you for building trust with clients? Well, I'll just repeat what everybody else has said, and probably I'll just summarize it. These words have come over and over again, authentication, uh, verification, um, 
convenient facilitation. And at the end of the day, the question that I would ask each of us is, uh, is, is the technology made for human beings or are human beings made for technology? If at the end of the day, you have the best technology in place, but you still have human beings that are not trustworthy, then it's not really gonna facilitate trade as much. So the key thing is for us to first do self audits as individual. If each of us, us actually truly believe that we are here to actually solve problems and not to create problems, then we don't use technology to actually create barriers. We actually create it to break the barriers and, mm. and probably accelerate trade rather than um, delay trade or prevent others from trading. So at the end of the day, you have said it almost twice or thrice, trust, trust, trust. We yes. have to be a people that are trustworthy and it begins with a self audit and then moving that self audit on how we implement and use technology to be able to solve problems and make the world a better place for everybody else that then they can be able to trade better and improve their lives. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Yvonne. And Mikhail, your final words on trade, on trust, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, 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 lots of words, but I, I would describe it as, you know, you, this technology allows you to measure or, or confirm uh, the level uh, of integrity of a relationship um, or, or, uh, or, or, or risk from that perspective. Uh, so I think it, 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 it is probably sol solidifying uh, the relationship uh, because uh, it, it, you, you have the, 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 the background much more detailed and uh, much higher quality than before. And, and I think there's also something what, what, what we notice in our work is that if people even think uh, that there is you now a satellite above their heads and, and checking out where they are, what to do, they seem to be, let's call it more compliant uh, to what you expect them to do than, than not. Even if, if they don't have a tracker on their motorbike, we feel that they that they are more careful with their bikes and, and the stuff mm -hmm. than with the guys with a tracker. As at some point, it, it, it helps people's attitude, people's behavior uh, to change in, in, a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Michiel. And Matea, the last word on trust. Yeah. Okay. So it's uh, coming from the trust, you know, what I see is that technology can help, you know, agribusinesses in East Africa to make the real uh, trustful relationships, you know, with, without, you know, with too much traders or uh, middlemen. Okay. This means that they will accelerate trade and they will generate, let's say, more money to be used for the investments. And this, you know, coming then directly to the banks will create a much more trustful, uh, let's say, clients for the banks, you know, and here I see the, the real, you know, power, you know, how to empower the regional trade in East Africa, you know, to accelerate the trade, you know, make more clients for the bank, the bank can invest, you know, and the, the, the agribusinesses in East Africa can invest, you know, so and I do see that the trust will be uh, will be built along this chain in a very, very near future. That's great. Thank you very much, Matea. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, thank you to my five panelists for a really interesting discussion.